Indeed, Jim. Uh, vice members are welcome to use a Wi-Fi connected m mobile, and as we've known since we've been in here, sometimes our mobile phones interfere with the uh, uh, with the microphones. But just be careful of that. Uh, are we aware of any apologies? Um, Jim Alice just been trying to get me, so maybe he's going to be late. Okay. Well, we'll, pr we'll proceed. We'll proceed on anyhow. Uh, there is a reminder to the members to declare any relevant financial or other interest of the committee meeting as applicable. I would wish the committee to be aware that I have been approached by representatives representing BT on the particular issue to do, I believe, with LPS. Uh, as the chair of this committee, I made it clear that uh, I thank them for their approach, but I did not wish to receive any other briefings because this was very much a matter to do with the Public Accounts Committee. And that is where it should remain. It is up to individual members themselves if they wish to make any declarations, but uh, I think it is appropriate that I declared that at, that, that at this point as we move forward. Uh, if we move on to the draft minutes of proceedings of 1 July 2020. Draft mi uh, minutes of the meetings are at page 5. Members, are we content with the draft minutes that are an accurate record of proceedings? Yeah. All those say aye. aye. Are we happy for them to be published on the website? Yeah. Uh, next item in matters arising, report of the examiner and statutory rules to the Assembly and the appropriate committee's 15th report. Uh, four members uh, tabled at page 3 is the report of the ESR. In this report, the ESR considered the following SRs relating to the committee. SR 2020-110, the rates exemption for automatic telling machines in Northern Ireland, and drew no attention to this order. And 2020-111, uh, the business tenancies restriction of forfeiture of relevant period Northern Ireland regulations 2020 was reported to breach the 21-day rule, but the ESR was content that the examiner statute rule was content with the ex explanation from the department. Are we content? Thank you. Shall we crack on? Uh, can we invite Jeff and Pamela in, please? Thanks very much indeed. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Pamela. Yeah. We're nearly like old friends now, aren't we? <laughs> okay, team. This is about in-year monitoring outcome of the June monitoring round. Public spending director at Department of Finance. Uh, I'll remind members that the agenda items will be recorded by Hansard. Uh, the clerk's briefing paper is on page 13, and the ministerial statement is on page 16. Um, Jeff, just before I ask you to make an opening statement, have we got any read out what's likely to happen with the Chancellor this afternoon? Uh, no, not at the minute. Um, we will there will hopefully be an email in my inbox when the Chancellor stands on his feet at half twelve. Um, and then we'll get the full kind of implications for our uh, budget position when the Chancellor sits down again um, and followed by a call with Treasury at three o'clock to clarify anything. So I'll be itching to get out of here. Okay, uh, I know you will. Uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, if it would, as soon as you've got some read out of it, and bearing in mind this will be the last committee meeting until September, but it's appropriate that we have a chance to see what the implications are and the likely implications are, because I, I understand just by the media speculation there might be Barnet consequentials of up to about three quarters of a billion that may come through. But I think it's important that we have as a chance of a committee to get an oversight of that, even if, even if we are in recess in a closed period. Absolutely. And um, our intention is that the Minister will write to both his executive colleagues and uh, yourself this afternoon once we know the implications for, for the, uh, the Northern Ireland position. Could I also, through the committee, could I just ask if maybe the Minister could also write to the Economy Committee as well? Um, and I think infrastructure. I'm just thinking of what has been trialled that's likely to come, or trailed that's been coming out. So it might be appropriate if we could write to all those sort of committees as well. But please, and if we're content with that, team, content. Okay. Sorry, Jeff, over to you. Certainly, thank you for the opportunity to brief you today on the outcome of the June monitoring exercise. The exercise itself was comprised of three significant elements: 2019-20 provisional outturn, the June monitoring exercise itself and then COVID-19 reprioritisation, taking each of those in turn. In 2019-20 provisional outturn, when compared to the January monitoring position, departmental 2019-20 provisional outturn showed an overspend of £187 million in resource Dell and a £103 million underspend in capital Dell. However, these figures reported have been impacted by COVID-19. 
for resource Dell, while the Treasury provided all the additional Barnet for COVID-19 measures in the financial year 2021. Some £212 million pounds of expenditure related to small business grant scheme and free school meals was incurred in the financial year 2019-20. We felt it was important not to delay the funding, uh, and Treasury are aware of this position and working with us on it. Adjusting for this and including some central items means that there was £28 million pounds of resource Dell available for carry forward into 2021. Capital Dell underspend is significant and has been partially impacted by COVID-19. Discussions are ongoing with the Treasury on how to handle this. I, just, uh, I understand and we thank the Minister, and I think I will sort of drop him a note anyhow, but that business with the, the other regional finance ministers going directly to the Treasury and asking for more flexibility, I think, that, I think we as a committee would like to see uh, the, the Minister being able to avail of that if that is the direction of travel we are likely to go in. Absolutely. Um, we will be pressing for that on that particular issue. Um, we will be looking for resource um, capital flexibility. The, the announcement in the press was related to it was also related to borrowing, mm -hmm. um, but that's more in line with the Scottish and the Welsh where they are in terms of their funding model, and um, because obviously they have income tax that is uh, for Scotland, for example, have income tax that they are in control of, and the borrowing then helps them to um, manage economic shock more appropriately. So mm -hmm. our budget is a wee bit more insulated, so therefore we have less need for that particular borrowings, but certainly the resource to capital flexibility and end year um, carry forward arrangements are things that we will be seeking and um, absolutely will be um, pressing Treasury hard for those. Mm. Um, well, you, Nat, you have our full support. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, we are discussing the capital level underspend with Treasury in the interim. We are planning the carry forward of the full amount available under existing budget exchange rules, which is £21 million pounds of capital. This can be re revisited once discussions with Treasury have concluded. As indicated at January monitoring, we have a significant underspend in financial transactions capital. Of the £92 million underspend, we are only permitted to carry forward £20 million, pounds, meaning that £72 million pounds has been returned to the Treasury. In terms of the 2021 June monitoring and the COVID-19 reprioritisation exercises, uh, given the importance of the COVID-19 response, it was decided to consider both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 pressures against the total amount of funding available. As well as the amounts carried forward from 1920, additional funding has also been received from non-COVID-19 Barnet of 3.5 million resource Dell and 6.4 million capital Dell. Additional Barnet consequentials from COVID-19 response of £191 million pounds resource Dell and £3.1 million pounds of capital Dell. Adjustments to central items, including revised rates forecasts of £10.7 million resource Dell and £5.1 million capital Dell. Reinstatement of the confidence and supply funding provides an additional £15 million pounds of capital Dell. Um, committee may remember that we used the £30 million pounds of resource funding that was reinstated as part of a COVID-19 response in May. In addition, in addition, departments have identified reduced requirements of 2.9 million of resource Dell and 25.8 million of capital Dell. There have been also some easements in COVID response measures previously announced. Four million pounds from the Department of Education for substitute teachers, and 0.8 million pounds for the temporary resting place from DOJ. Um, the Department for Economy has identified £53 million of reduced requirement from business grant schemes. This is to be held centrally to address further sectoral support measures. Overall, £140 million of resource Dell, £68 million of capital Dell and £200 million of financial transactions capital were available for reallocation. In total, departments bid for £633.7 million of resource Dell, £63.7 million of capital Dell and £20 million of FTC. This is split between June monitoring bids, the business as usual type bids, and COVID-19 response bids in the tables that accompany the statement. In terms of allocations, DFI have received a further £30 million resource Dell from the funding set aside for the transport sector, and allocations of £139.9 million resource Dell, £63.7 million of capital Dell, and £20 million of FTC have been agreed, and they are shown in Table I of the statement. Uh, running through the resource Dell allocations very briefly, Department for Communities received £22.7 million, and that was in relation to PPE costs, community support fund, vulnerable homeless people, benefit processing, culture resilience and sports resilience. The Department for Economy received £4.7 million for Invest NI marketing and SME improvement grants. 
higher education teaching grants and income loss. The Department for Education received £39 million for free school meals over the summer, activity to support children and learning in that period, childcare and EA pressures, including PPE. The Department for Health received £51.4 million for surge planning and Nightingale stand-up, elective care, service transformation and mental health action plan. The Department for Infrastructure received £5.5 million in relation to Northern Ireland water lost income. The Department for Justice or Department of Justice received £13.5 million for PPE, PSNI, prisons, PSNI prison service and lost income for NI courts and tribunal service. And the Executive Office received half a million pounds for press work in relation to the executive response to COVID and two and a half million pounds for the administration costs in relation to victims' payments. In terms of capital Dell allocations, the Department of Health received £38.7 million pounds, and that's related to COVID-19 pressures and essential equipment and an invest to save capital projects. The Department for Economy received £25 million pounds for the Ulster University Greater Belfast Development. And in terms of financial capital transactions, financial transactions capital Dell allocations, the Department for Economy received £20 million. Pounds. That's in relation to Invest NI support to potential startups and tourism NI investment in local tourist attractions. Overall, in the outcome, this rep represents the allocation of all funding available for resource Dell, with £2.7 million pounds of capital Dell and £180 million pounds of FTC remaining to be allocated. There remains 83.8 million held centrally for PPE, 29.5 million for transport sector, and 53 million for further business support. The business rates measures announced in May have now been funded in full, with no overcommitment. Flexibility to reallocate budgets was provided to departments, and the outcome of that is included in the table to the statement. Uh, this flexibility will be extended to the October round in view of the fluctuating financial position. Full details are in the tables accompanying the statement. Um, and as you mentioned, we are anticipating further additional funding coming um, from today's uh, Chancellor's announcement. So the next quarter's um, monitoring round is going to be look, one of the questions we're going to have to ask is when are we ever going to see the estimates? And obviously, with the additional money coming in, hopefully, additional money coming in today, and there would probably be a need for further reprioritisation exercise because you know I think many members will be asking questions about particularly money that had been has been held centrally, particularly around sort of transportation issues and other particular issues as well, mm -hmm. and also with the business rate relief, uh, the amounts of volumes that are involved in that. So, how are you anticipating the next stage? Are we looking at when the next monitoring round is? Are we going to have a budget number three bill? <coughs> What's the likely timings do you expect? Um, it's all subject to uh, agreement at um, ministerial level, but our, and our working assumption at this moment in time is that we will have uh, a further exercise depending on the outcome of today's announcement, um, and that will the, that exercise will um, hopefully feed into the main estimate process, which is due for um, uh, coming before the committee at the start of September. So mm -hmm. we don't anticipate any further delay to that process. So start of September, we'll be able to say the main estimate. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of our supply colleagues. Um, uh, in September, <laughs> uh, we'll maybe rein back. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Thank you very much, indeed. Sir, uh, Paul. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, can I ask again? I suppose, because I'm still troubled as to the difference between a periodic monitoring round, you know, within a year, and a reprioritisation. What's the difference between those two programmes? So the, the monitoring rounds um, are relatively fixed. There's three a year, um, and the timetable is set in advance of, of those monitoring rounds being commissioned. Um, we are still working through how the, re the COVID response works, um, and basically, whenever we feel that there's a need for um, further allocations, if there's significant announcements, um, we will be looking at that. Part of the reprioritisation exercise that we that aligned with June monitoring this time round um, was departments looking at that, that particular COVID response, and hence why you'll see in the tables that the bids are separated, as in business as normal type bids, and then the COVID response bids to give that transparency of what we would have been doing normally and what we are actually doing and departments are asking for in response to the COVID-19 situation. Um, 
Part of that reprioritisation exercise was also looking departments to um, reallocate funding internally um, to deal specifically with the COVID-19 position. And the, the tables in the back of the, the statement um, identify about £140 million pounds where departments have taken um, existing budget and reprioritised that to deal with their emerging pressures on the, on the COVID side of things. So, um, there, there is this, this time round, those two exercises um, were aligned um, and amalgamated um, on, on um, exactly at the same time table, so we were able to announce them at the same time. I imagine then the next, the next potential position is that we will have a further COVID response exercise where it will not align with monitoring, but the outcome of it will then be brought back into line at, at, at October time. So, um, it's important to deal with the, the allocations as soon as we can for the COVID response to get the money out there to deal with those situations, to help businesses, to support the vulnerable, um, and allow then the, the financial um, position to play, play catch up as part of the October monitoring round later on. Why are we not agile enough as, a, as an executive to reprioritise money through normal process? I think the, the current process, the current business as usual process, um, has served us well. I have been working in this area for about 18 years, and the three monitoring rounds, or three or four, depending on uh, your history, um, have served the departments very well. Um, there is a lot of work involved in trying to understand the position for departments. So, actually, three monitoring rounds a year is a lot more agile and flexible than the likes of Whitehall. Um, so, it has served us well. Uh, where we have, we have found that we needed additional response to the COVID situation. It's a, a once-in-a-lifetime situation. So, um, I think that we are responding flexibly by introducing additional areas of allocation, or additional times when we are allocating funding, so that we're not delaying it and we're not saying we have three monitoring rounds and that's when we will deal with it. We are being responsive and we are trying to to respond as and when there is a sufficient pool of money there or sufficient call for additional funding. Yeah, so so I, I get what the monitoring rounds have always been. What's to stop a department, any department, from reprioritising within their block of finance the, at any time of the year? Um, so the normal rules, under the normal process, um, departments would have to ask the executive to reprioritise certain funding. So, if they had funding that they had for a project that wasn't going ahead, um, instead of spending it on other particular areas, that department would be forced to bring it back to the executive to look at the wider prioritisation, so that there is an, an overarching view of what is important rather than what is important within a department. Um, so, that is what normally happens. Uh, the flexibility that was given to departments up until this monitoring round and has been now extended until October effectively allows departments to reprioritise within their own budget. So they have that ability to be agile um, this financial year. Now that we don't foresee that being extended beyond this financial year, and we'll take it um, at each financial exercise and review it as necessary. But certainly, we feel that there is the need for departments to respond agilely at, um, in a more agile and flexible way. And this is sorry, just a, sorry, just Paul, just a, uh, just that particularly because previously they were allowed up to a flex of a, a million quid, but now that's now shifted on. So now, as of the COVID measures, that we're now sort of given a much more uh, sort of responsive approach to that. They are given much more latitude now um, to help them to respond to any particular emerging pressures, um, especially in relation to COVID. Okay, uh, on your table E, previously announced COVID-19 allocations. Uh, you have within the centre held uh, part PPE 83.8 million, transport sector 59.5 million, business rate support 119.9. Now, what we have seen, the bill for PPE that's talked about, and I don't even know if I can mention it here now, this is the problem, is a, is a lot more than 83.3. That money may well have had to be dished out very, very rapidly and quickly at any given time. How, where would that money have come from? 
Because at the minute we've got 83.3 million in the centre held pot for that PPE order. Um, second part of that question then is the transport sector, because of a Barnet cons consequential, with, we had 59.5, but on the day of the debate, the minister told me that has now diminished to 29 million. Now, if he was able to tell me that in the, on the floor of the assembly, why was it published and for all MLAs to peruse or cross the figure of, of 59.5 still within the table? Are, are we out of date? Are our monitoring rounds uh, and outturns out of date before they even get to the assembly floor? Um, on the first point, the, um, we recognise that there is a significant um, cost to PPE. Um, you will see there in that table E that the Department of Health have been allocated £61.3 million pounds for PPE. So they already have um, an allocation in relation to what their immediate needs are. 83.8 is held centrally pending um, a further allocation if necessary and looking at um, where that that PPE pressure exists. So you will see as well that um, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, have also had an allocation of PPE about £4.9 million. Pounds. So th the, the funding has been allocated and PPE stocks have been purchased in relation to the likes of health and justice. Uh, this 83.8 is held back centrally so that we know whenever further pressures emerge, we are able to respond immediately so that there is no delay in the system, um, that the funding is there. We have the funding ready and, and able to go. But I would put it to you that that still wouldn't be all those PPE orders through all the departments still wouldn't be enough to satisfy the demand that was needed to be met immediately before the before the purchase or the stock of supply. And as departments um, respond to the next COVID nineteen exercise, um, we will get a, a better idea of what their demands are in terms of bids for PPE. Um, we will be able to look at what Barnet consequentials we're receiving hopefully today. Um, and see whether we need to direct further additional support to PPE. So that, that issue is being assessed by departments, and um, we will be able to look at how we best provide additional funding, um, should it be necessary. And then the transport sector? Yep, certainly. Um, the, the table that was provided, um, if I can call it up, I can't remember what Table E, e sorry. Table sorry. E. Um, that, that table is. Um, Previously announced COVID-19 allocations. This was a, an attempt by us to make sure that uh, the executive and the assembly um, had as much information as possible. So these are previously announced allocations. So we didn't want to to not include those. Um, so those are previously announced ones, and then the the, the allocations at table I will include the further announced ones, which is um, an additional 30 million that went to. Uh, the Department for Infrastructure for um, tra uh, TransLink Lost Income. So, okay, okay. so that is the, the, the trying to do an evolution of what has happened. Certainly. Thank you then for that, for that clarification. Final question then for me. Uh, I asked the Minister on the floor what the current situation was with regards to overcommitment of the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, previously, he had told us that it was about £100 million, I think, I recall through memory. But he told me on the day in the House that that overcommitment has now gone. What is the current position with the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Executive and its block grant with all the Barnet consequentials up to this point? Are we overcommitted? Are we in the red or the black? Whereabouts are we? Uh, we are not overcommitted at this stage. So all allocations on the resource side have been, um, have been put out there. We are running with a zero uh, overcommitment on on resource within so no work in there. We have a small surplus on capital um, held for uh, further allocation and a, a large surplus on the FTC. The, the overcommitment that the Minister may have been referring to was in relation to the pressure on business rates where we had announced further measures mm -hmm. that would reduce business rates or, or remove business rates for this financial year. We have now, as part of this monitoring round, addressed that um, and um, got ourselves to a, a zero position. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Matthew? Thank you, Chair, and thanks um, both for, for coming and giving evidence. I just wanted to focus a bit on um, capital. Um, so the, 
Um, capital underspend is just over 100 million for 1920. How does that? That's a 7%. Is that a 7% underspend? On yes, it's it's much more significant than we would have normally expected this time of year. What would the what was? You may not have it at hand, but roughly, what would the normal percentage of capital Dell underspend? Um, are the, the budget exchange scheme that Treasury run allow us to carry forward a certain amount each year. That runs at 1.5 per cent of capital, um, which is equivalent to, um, check with Pamela on this one, 12 or 14 million pounds. Of 20 this year. 20 this year, right. So um, we would have anticipated um, normally we would have been under that, so it would have been less than that. Uh, in, a, in a normal year, we would have anticipated not breaching that one and a half percent of our capital budget. So normally, our capital Dell underspend is beneath the that scheme, the threshold of that scheme. So, right, it's it's at seven percent this year, but it's normally only a couple of percent. It's it's normally less than one and a half percent. Yes, we aren't normally handing back capital Dell, no. but we are not making use of. Um, uh, the sister of, as it were, of Capital Dell, FTC. Correct. Um, what's the total? What was the total number uh, when you add together FTC allocations and Capital Dell of, of unused allocation? Um, in terms of unused allocation, uh, but between um, Capital Dell and FTC, uh, approximately um, 170 million. Pound, no, 190 million pounds. Right. Yeah. 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 What would that? Is it possible to do? If you have the information, a, a comparison between other other devolves in terms of the percentage of unused capital, whether it's conventional capital Dell or FTC. Uh, we don't have that information at this stage. Um, to, uh, other devolved administrations um, will be in the process, like ourselves, of discussing the outcome with Treasury and how that outcome, the implications of that outcome in terms of carry forward. The COVID-19 situation provides a new dimension to how we look at carry forward and how we deal with that intra with Treasury. So you, the, the announcement today was uh, essentially a, cap a, a call for a capital current, which turn is that that relates to. Does that relate to what's been in the to 1920, uh, or uh, in the in the sense that are are you asking, are we asking for some of that 103? That's the capital deal. Are we asking for some of that to be converted? Um, so that's 1920. Our turn. So I presume you can't be that that's that's been handed back now. In that one, but are we, is it for 2021? We're asking for the. Capital current switch. So there's there's a couple of issues here. We will be looking to Treasury um, to make a case that some of the capital underspend in 1920 was related to COVID and unavoidable, mm. um, and we'll be looking for um, their consideration of carrying that forward into 2021. So that's the first issue, um, uh, and depending on that, then we'll be able to utilise that capital in this particular financial year. We're also then looking. At, um, to Treasury to say to, to provide an argument that we would be able to more flexibly manage our budget if we were able to switch between capital and resource. So we'd be looking at towards the end of the year, understanding what the pressures are in our resource system or our capital system, and, and figuring out whether we can alleviate one by transferring um, capital to resource. The, the, that would be quite a dramatic. That would be quite a big shift in our the framework of our public finances if, if that. Are we asking for sort of total flexibility or percentage flexibility, or sort of are we just on year end? Well, we haven't spent 50 million of capital. We'll just put it into current. Or there's, for example, an issue with you know there's an, there's an overspend in health or education. Yeah, uh, we, we will be seeking um, the maximum flexibility we can with Treasury. Um, whether that is uh, I mean, ideally, that would be no no kind of restriction to how that. Goes. Treasury may have a different view and will have a different view on that in terms of their their um, ability to uh, look at what their fiscal rules are and how they change and evolve in, in the, the COVID-19 situation. But we would certainly be pressing Treasury for um, as much flexibility as possible in, in that position. We will not know how that goes until further down the line. Would you say we have a structural challenge here with getting 
with investment spending. We see. Does, would you say? Is it fair to say that um, our departments have a challenge getting capital spending out the door? I think our departments are are very um, are are very good at looking at conventional capital and understanding how conventional capital will relate to their specific projects and and trying to spend that. And I think the the underspend of less than one and a half percent over the last number of years has, has proved that departments are able to spend capital. Mm -hmm. Where we have um, further issues are on financial transactions capital, and the minister has been very clear on that and wants to get that process improved. And we are working on how that process might be improved. But the, the FTC isn't part of the. Is that is that part of the flexibility you're looking for from Treasury? Do you, you, that, that's a financial. Oh, that's that's a separate issue. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a risk that by asking for flexibility, that kind of flexibility from the Treasury, particularly as you go through these monitoring rounds, you are you might be incentivising departments to um, forestall? Just this is a completely <coughs> hypothetical question, but I'm interested in the answer. Is there a risk you incentivise departments to forestall, forestall capital spending in the belief that they might be able to switch it to? A resource pressure. I don't think so. Um, certainly, we haven't been. Um, whilst we are pressing for this, our message to departments is that that is not in place. And um, even if it was, that would apply at a Northern Ireland block level rather than individual departmental level. Um, so, what we would be looking for departments to do is understand their own particular needs um, and provide those to us. So that if, if there are pressures on resource, they're telling us about those pressures. If there is um, underspending capital, they're telling us so that we can reprioritise and change things. Um, so I, I don't think departments will be in the space of delaying because they think that they can move this money because there's no guarantee of that that flexibility being open to them individually. Okay. Cheers. Thanks, Robertson. Uh, I'm on the, the same subject. Now, did I catch you right that 72 million was handed back to Treasury because of the financial transaction capital issue? That's correct. 72 million pounds of that um, was uh, returned to Treasury. Um, the, the Assembly research team did some work on this a few years ago, and it suggested the, the budget for that this, for this year uh, was 20, 60 million. So, how could we have handed back 72 million if the allocation was only 60 million? So the, the the budget for 2019-20, which is the year that, that this funding it relates to, um, there was I can't remember offhand, but there was certainly about 100 and there was over 100 million pounds. So some allocated to departments, but the majority of the the funding was not allocated to departments because there wasn't the appetite for it. As well as that, and it's very important. Thing to mention that there wasn't the ability for our housing associations to use some of that money because of the classification issue. I understand that's going through the assembly at the minute, or maybe it has just passed. The assembly. redefinition of housing associations. Right, private sector housing yes. associations. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I mean, I mean, I, I know in your field, 72 million is neither here nor there, but but 72 million to one of our departments could be an absolute lifesaver. Is there any proactive work being done by your department to stimulate projects which would soak up that 72 million? Particularly when we're, you, you're saying there that, in response to, uh, to Matthew's question, uh, that we are now in a break-even situation, which I think is quite remarkable. There is no, there is no overcommitment. The so like problem is that UK PLC is overcommitted to the tune of £72,000 pounds per every person in the country. That's a slight technical difficulty. So why it's weird not overcommitted, the country as a whole is. Now, surely there should be some creative work being done by your department to try and access that very large amount of money. Absolutely. Um, it's a body of work that has been slightly delayed by um, prioritising the response to COVID-19. But um, the likes of Strategic Investment Board are working with private sector or individuals and companies to understand their needs around some of uh, the projects. We are looking at putting together a paper for our minister. Um, one of the, the options within that is looking at trying to understand maybe a central area of expertise, which would allow departments um, to, to utilise a central expertise on 
um, providing loans to the private sector, understanding the kind of due diligence that's that's related to that. So, um, if you, if you think about the normal processes and practices, to finance departments at the minute um, don't necessarily have the expertise to deal with how loans are issued and, and the, the due diligence required and the, the, the legal steps to go through those. They're more um, used to working with grant funding and, and allocations in that way. So if we can create an area of central expertise, then that will hopefully de-risk some of the, the, the... That's a very American term, de-risk. <laughs> What's that in English? Reduce, it's some, yeah. It will reduce the risk that departments will feel that they are under in terms of trying to provide the appropriate due diligence, trying to get the, the right legal position on uh, and doing their homework basically on the private sector. Where, well, where well, I'll put it to you that um, we probably are facing the mother of all recessions, which is going to hit Northern Ireland very badly. And any capital project we can get off the ground will help, Obviously, particularly when you're talking figures of £100 million plus. So I think, I'd like to think in, say, two years' time that we have been able to leverage all of that money to try and rejuvenate a, a, a very, very uh, damp down construction industry. Now, you don't return all of the F, uh, FCC capital. Uh, the figures I've seen, uh, it ranges between 60 and 75 per cent. has to go back. How much, what percentage went back in 1920? So, so the, current, um, the current agreement with Treasury is that we will return 80 per cent of so that's FCC. Risen. That's risen recently then? No, that, that, um, it was an initially 60 per cent. Um, whenever FTC first started in, back in 2012-13, um, after a year or two it rose to 80%, so it was 80% for a number of years now. Well then surely the mechanism to try and release that into the economy for, for 21, or 2021 is to ask the Treasury to reduce that to say 50%, so, so at least we have this additional capital money. Um, has there been any lobbying on that? Why has it been allowed to drift up from 60 to 80? Well, certainly, that was the rules in place at the time, and we were aware that Treasury, in the first financial year, were looking at 60 per cent, and then subsequently 80 per cent. It is something that we are discussing with Treasury. Um, there is a group uh, of devolved administrations in Treasury who are looking at financial transactions capital and understanding the, the barriers to uh, um, using it. It is something that is not necessarily unique to Northern Ireland in terms of the, the difficulty using it. Um, however, uh, we would be certainly pressing Treasury for um, more favourable terms for FTC and, and continue to do so. And finally, um, because of the crisis, we were actually in surplus on the capital side of things because clearly some projects didn't go ahead. What rules are you bound by at the moment to stop you transferring that over to resource? Um, tr Treasury's rules are very clear. We cannot transfer capital to resource um, within our own control totals. So we cannot increase our resource control total um, and reduce our, cap our capital control total accordingly. So we are they are very clear. There is no scope for that at the moment. So, if, if we if we moving into this financial year, if we hit a, a huge crisis in health, surely there has to be some flexibility to enable some of that to transfer over to Department of Health Resource Dale. And that's precisely what we are um, pressing Treasury for: is that is further flexibility to allow us to do exactly that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, Dr. Rolf, Jasper, Lass, uh, Rich. Uh, it's very nice meeting with you again. You're very welcome. Um, when it comes to priorities uh, and and allocating to the different departments and so on. Is it the case that uh, if it's COVID related at all, it trumps all other demands within departments? I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think their departments are very aware of the the additional demands that COVID nineteen response um, creates for them. Um, and in some cases that will be um, an immediate and pressing demand that trumps everything else. The likes of health um, would probably be in that category, um, but it's not. It's not necessarily um, to say that it, it trumps everything because public services still need to be provided, vulnerable still need to be protected in other ways other than COVID nineteen response. So um, departments, whilst very aware of what demands COVID nineteen places on them, they're also very aware of their duty and their obligations uh, to do what is termed business as usual. 
Uh, and in fact, it's probably in relation to that uh, business as usual. Um, and as they say, all politics is local in the one area. They have such as done as well, to even in the minister's statement and so on, is the continuing support that they have to airports. But in particular, with the city of Derry Airport, uh, can you give us any other information there on what type of support is intended that would be provided by central government to the city of Derry Airport? Uh, over and above just for say the likes of uh, the passenger duty or security arrangements of the likes? Uh, I'm not aware specifically of the details around that. Um, the Department of Infrastructure are usually the ones that lead on um, City of Derry Airport issues. Uh, I, I am aware that obviously there's a Department for Transport package that the City of Derry Airport I think have availed of in some way or other or, or, or their carriers have. Um, there is also the £29.5 million for transport response sitting centrally, which can be used um, for further measures in that area, should it be deemed that that is necessary. But obviously, that's, that's a policy issue beyond my remit. I think Melissa and I would both like you to be able to tell us that APD is being bent, but you haven't had any headers up on that. I would like to tell you that too. <laughs> I'd like you to say you're not going to pay too many quid a year for you an APD. Are you asking anything from Trinity? On Have you got a particular ask on, on the airports or the help for the airports? Or is that outside? I mean, are you racking up an order to put a bit into Treasury? Just on. From what this is yeah, certainly, there was there was a number of discussions with the Department for Transport on the initial um, response. I, I am not aware personally of any further um, negotiation there, but that's not to say that it's not happening. Okay. Pat, it's your turn, anyway. All right, thanks very much, and um, I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank uh, your department uh, over this whole COVID and uh, all the help and uh, that, that we've had there from us. I'm trying to look at. at what I said when I first came into the council was uh, multi-year monitoring rounds. I mean, have it's got a time scale for that. Just have a time scale when you're going to set up your next, when the next budget and round goes. Do you intend to to do another trawl of prioritisation for the October uh, monitoring round? And is that in place at the minute? And do you have a time scale for that? Certainly. So uh, we'll deal, deal with those uh, in a couple of ways. There's the first bit is the the current financial year that we're in. Um, so as we go through it, obviously there's the, the October monitoring round that is set and, and it's fixed, and departments will be working in some regards towards that timetable. Uh, what happens between now and October will, um, in some ways, depend on what happens today or what maybe already has happened today, um, uh, in terms of the Chancellor's announcement. So uh, I suspect that we will be looking at what that outcome is and whether we need to then go back out to departments um, on a further financial exercise to. Um, allow departments to pick up funding in year fairly quickly, rather than having to wait to October. I think October seems too long away to to wait for. So I suspect we will be looking at uh, trying to do something else, depending on what the Chancellor announces. Um, and then on the the second point of that, on multi-year budgeting, uh, the the plan um, was that we would have a, a spending review announced pretty much at the minute um, in July. Um, and then that would have a multi-year settlement, and that would allow us to do a multi-year budget process. That obviously has been thrown to the, to the side somewhat by COVID-19 response. We are still anticipating that Treasury will do a spending review at some stage, probably uh, in the autumn, uh, and hopefully they will announce a multi-year settlement at that stage, and that will allow us then to do multi-year budgets and plan for those multi-year budgets. But there's a not there's a there's a bit of uncertainty. Um, it never seems to go quite as we expect it to. And uh, I mean, things seem to come very fast and heavy to us in order to try and scrutinise the, what, what was coming out to us. I mean, uh, is there a chance that uh, you know, probably looking probably some sort of an insurance that there will be sufficient time in built between the department return and the consideration by the executive for committee scrutiny. I, mean, I don't think it really has happened. Not that I'm an expert on it, but I'd like to think that it went on a lot better before, and I seem to be able to do it at the moment. Yeah, in, in terms of um, f f business as usual, the likes of a, a monitoring rounds, business as usual, would tend to have a little bit more time to allow the department to look at what the individual departments are doing, scrutinise a little bit of that, inform that process. Um, we're very clear 
in our in our guidelines uh, on in-year monitoring that departments should be responding to their committees, and the committees have an absolute right of um, interrogating that information and, and scrutinising and um, playing their part in that. Uh, the the COVID-19 response has been a little bit more reactive um, and has to be done a little bit more quicker time, uh, and that's not ideal. Uh, on we recognise that that's not ideal from a, a, an assembly scrutiny point of view, but there's obviously a balance to be struck with actually providing support and reassurance to businesses, to vulnerable people, and uh, the, the scrutiny process as well. So um, we, we we try our best to put in as much time as possible, but recognise that the, that doesn't always satisfy the committee. Uh, someone slipped through, Thanks. Chair, but just, yeah, we have the like for for what what. <coughs> Jim. Yes, thank you. First of all, I apologise for, apologise for being late. My apologies if this point has already been covered. Um, in a monitoring round, can a individual department's priority be overridden and the Department of Finance decide that their priority should be something different? Certainly, from our perspective, the, we, we would have no. Um, whilst we would look at individual departmental priorities and, and look at the assessment of those, um, we wouldn't be looking to override departmental priorities. We would look maybe perhaps to refine them and to put their feet back on the ground a little bit in, in some cases. The reason I ask that is on Tuesday, the minister, uh, when he made the statement on the Tuesday, informed the House that £10 million pounds would be allocated to replace lost income across the transport sector, and Table 1 shows that allocated to infrastructure. But when we go to the infrastructure bids, they never bid for that money. So who decided that infrastructure could get £10 million? Pounds down to 5%. So it did ask for other things that it didn't get. Who decided that instead it should get ten million for a subject it didn't ask for? So um, it's an important point, um, and it might be the structure of the tables that um, um, has provided a, a, a little bit of um, confusion on the issue. So there are there are two sets of tables in terms of bids. Yes. There's a COVID set of bids yes. and, a, um, and a non-COVID set of bids. Yes, so table, table H, F and table H. Yeah. So table H, you'll look at um, DFI have um, bid for a number of areas in there: DVA lost income from on-street parking planning applications, Rathlin Ferry lost income, Strangford Ferry lost income, and then obviously the Translink lost income, which was treated slightly separately. So, um, in allocating funding to uh, the, um, the Department for Infrastructure, £10 million was allocated to them for lost income. So that will include DVA, and the, um, and gives it gives the Department for Infrastructure a little bit of latitude in terms of where it so actually what are they, What does they bid for in terms of lost income? So you look at, for instance, um, the Driver and Vehicle uh, Association, or, um, the, the, the Driver and Vehicle area is £14.3 million. Pounds. Um, uh, NI Waters is related to lost income. Uh, as well, and certainly in part, and it's 31.6. On street parking was 1.5. Planning applications, 0.1. Rathlin Ferry, 0.5. Strangford Ferry, 0.7. So, um, while some of those are small, obviously the DVA one is, is quite significant because um, everything has stopped in terms of vehicle assessment. So, that's what that 10 million is for? It's, it's, it's to address the lost income related to DVA and all those sort of slightly smaller areas, the likes of the Crumlin Road Jail, on street parking, planning applications, and Rathlin Ferry and Strangford Ferry. Okay. And ask you this the Chancellor's announcement today of the abolition of stamp duty on properties up to half a million pounds, does that affect us um, in terms of income? I, I am not aware of. The implications of how that might affect us. Um, I, I don't recall it having. I think it goes directly to the exchequer. I'm not sure that it actually comes to us. Pardon, it's a UK tax, so it's not. Have we any collection costs like that? 
Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, just so you're aware, committee, I think it would probably be appropriate just to quickly update you. Uh, one of the areas that we'll be discussing today is obviously implications in the tourism and hospitality industry in Northern Ireland. And our Chancellor has announced today that VAT will be reduced from next Wednesday on food accommodation and attractions until the 12th of January from 20 per cent to 5 per cent. Brilliant. That is a significant Great. thing. And I think on behalf of the committee, uh, may we sort of record our thanks to the Chancellor of the Exchequer for bringing this uh, move into. And I think that will be very welcome by just about everybody in Northern Ireland. You will probably get a much greater update than we go through as we do as the rest of it. And thank you very much indeed for the evidence. There's just a couple of just things we just need to sort of follow up on. Sure. Um, the questions on financial transaction capital. Um, has anybody ever managed to spend this money that has been given? Um, having looked at what's happened in Scotland, what's happened in Wales, I seem to say, there seems to be a pattern here. Is that the Treasury make a great announcement and says, "Here's your all your financial transaction capital," and make it so difficult to spend it or actually allocate it? It's a real significant problem. It, it tends to work very well in England um, in terms of their housing program with the um, with the major public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Scotland, I think, have done something fairly major there as well, um, and they're they're looking at. Um, I think Wales do a, an investment bank type. Um, similar to our Northern Ireland investment fund, so um, and there are areas in Northern Ireland where we there has been a success in terms of the investment fund, in terms of up to the the reclassification where we could apply it to housing associations, albeit not to the same degree that uh, is applied in in England. So there are good success stories out there. It's just that we need to make sure that we are utilising it um, to the maximum. Okay, and the one that stands out to me, I mean, the amount of money that's been spent on. Uh, University of Ulster's York Road site seems to be uh, growing exponentially, and we're giving them another 25 million quid. Um, are we going to do anything about looking at the costs of this? Because uh, just by my own estimation of what's been spent on it, we could have built the much more important New York Street interchange. Could have been built well over the sort of the budget we've been spending. So, are we looking specifically at some of these areas, which I think are beginning to raise concerns? I think it's important to note that the the twenty five million pounds of capital allocated to the project will replace twenty five million pounds of FTC, um, and that's all subject to business case approval process. So, that um, that process is ongoing at the minute. So, um, if, if that process um, um, verifies that that is a value for money position, then that allocation will go ahead. Um, but, but we we do have rigorous business case approval processes in place. Okay, thanks for that, Matthew Small. Uh, precisely what I wanted to ask about the that's basically a, a, re, that's a switch of uh, from FTC to capital. Um, can I ask was that a was that a bid that was made by the Department of Economy or was that an approach um, that was uh, Asked for by the university. As far as I'm aware, it's a bid that was made by the Department for Economy. I suspect they've been uh, in in discussions with the university, but um, Pamela, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Yeah. yeah. Is that the big? That's the is that the single biggest FTC project or FTC allocation that we've ever had here. Um, it's certainly one of the bigger ones. Um, the investment fund over its lifetime is looking at 100 million pounds of FTC. Um, so, so the Northern Ireland Investment Fund overall, rather Northern than Ireland Investment Fund, yes. Ulster University, Fund. and um, there is a significant amount that would normally go to housing associations each and every year. Um, so, looking at that in at the cumulative effect would probably be uh, a similar. Is there any uh, any FTC that was allocated to Ulster that's being used, or is it is, it, is, it, is that twenty five million everything in FTC being converted into conventional capital? I am not aware of the, the specifics around what was what was allocated. Certainly there, in previous years there have been FTC allocations, so uh, it is it's a combination of both for the project. But it is an un, it, it's unusual that something which was basically a loan has now is being turned into a grant. There are lots of students at uh, Ulster University would quite like their loans to be turned into grants. Um, <laughs> Uh, are you aware of any other examples where, where that's happened? Um, I, I suspect, and I, I would have to to check this, but I suspect that um, 
looking at housing associations, we have in the past um, provided grants to <coughs> housing associations, and that was then turned into loan, FTC loan. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't. That, that's just thinking offhand. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just if we can get some readout through to the committee as soon as we know what's happening with the sort of the consequentials that are coming across to do that, the rest of it. We anticipate that today. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Thanks, but Jeff and Pamela, as usual. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, team, next up is the oral evidence functioning of government miscellaneous bill raised presentation of the regulation of public appointments. I think Tim's on. It's Tim on. No, I think Tim. Tim coming in. Come on, Tim. I just want to remind members this uh, item has been recorded for Hansard. A briefing note on the regulation appointments has been prepared for the Committee of Finance in the context of consideration during the committee stage of the bill, and it's page 59. Uh, Tim, would you like to make your presentation, please? Um, um, well, indeed, indeed, Chair. Thank you. Um, and uh, as you're a, as a long lost, uh, sort of, as you're a fairly regular attendee here, we're really glad to see you again. Thank you, <laughs> Chair. Um, yes, members of the paper that was prepared in the context of consideration of the function of government government bill, um, and it was a follow-on to the open session with the ex um, commissioner for public appointments, Ms. Houston. And there were a number of questions that uh, the committee wished to address. But the paper covers three broad issues, and I'll go through the paper and cover the three issues. Try and fill in some of the gaps, maybe that are in the paper, and then begin to address the remain. The paper firstly looks at Northern Ireland and the role of the Commissioner for Public Appointments here. Then it looks at um, Scotland and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life, who includes within their remit the regulation of public appointments. And then finally addresses the National Ombudsman Association standards in relation to the operation of ombudsman and in particular uh, the independent ombudsman bodies. So just to run quickly through the paper. Um, the second section deals with the Commissioner for Public Appointments in Northern Ireland. That rule was established in 1995 under the Public Appointments Order, um, and it's been amended uh, over time to uh, make changes to do with uh, devolution of powers and government structures. None of those have been particularly significant, but maybe what is of interest to members is the, the nature of the order. It's a prerogative uh, order. It's subject to very little assembly, if any, scrutiny, um, and it can be changed by, at the moment, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister using their powers in the Northern Ireland Act. Um, the changes that were made to the order were simply to address who would appoint the Commissioner, and that is now the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. Previously, it would have been the Secretary of State. Um, in terms of the functions of the Commissioner, they are set out in the 1995 order, and they have not changed over time. Um, you can see them on page 2. Broadly, the Commissioner um, is there to regulate, monitor and report on how ministers make appointments to public bodies, and they do that through issuing a code of practice, conducting audits, and requiring summary information, and conducting inquiries into policies and practice. And essentially, the functions that are set out there, that is the order. There is not much more uh, to it. So it is actually quite brief in its outline. I think that is a point. Um, Ms Houston may have made that it, you know, there certainly are gaps there. In terms of complaints, and that is one of the issues which is not specifically referenced in the functions, but it is addressed in the Code of Conduct, and you will see that on page 3. Where the Commissioner may investigate a complaint. So that presumably is an interpretation of an inquiry into a specific appointment. But again, that's one of the maybe the grey areas that Ms. Houston was, was um, uh, pointing out. So the Commissioner can investigate complaints that are made directly um, to her. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I said, the Commissioner may take action. But it's not exactly clear what that action is, and it would appear that the action that the Commissioner takes is to make recommendations to the Department. Um, beyond that, it is difficult to see where the enforcement lies. Presumably, um, a decision by the Commissioner to make a recommendation, should, should an issue go to judicial review, uh, would bear on one side of the, the argument. But that is, again, 
that's not dealt with in the functions or in the, the code. The code simply says that she can take action, and, um, and it, you know that that's where it stops. In terms of the real detail of the operation of the commissioner, um, that's set out in terms of the relationship with the, uh, the, uh, the executive office in the memorandum of understanding and, finan and financial memorandum. So that was drawn up in 2015 consultation between the Commissioner and the Department, and it is much more, more detailed than the order. It would run to approximately 20, 30 pages and sets out in great detail how the Department um, will manage um, the relationship in terms of finances, and I'll go on to that in a minute. So the relationship between the Commissioner and the uh, Department, as set out in the, in the Memorandum of Understanding, is one of arm's length. Um, I'll get to the Ombudsman standards later, but it's almost a subjective question of whether that's sufficient independence um, as mm. measured against other bodies. But that's the relationship uh, between the Department and the Commissioner. And the Memorandum of Understanding then goes on to explain a bit more about the relationship and, the, in particular, the responsibilities of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And we can see that the, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister approve the policy and the remit within which the CPA will operate. They, they keep the Assembly informed as to the Commissioner's performance. The Commissioner carries out her duties in line with the order, um, and the First and Deputy First Minister can, by prerogative order, change that originating legislation. And the Department provides the resources to the Commissioner. So, she sits within the departmental boundary. That's quite a close relationship in terms of, of financing. Um, and again, that's dealt with in detail in the financial memorandum. I won't go through that, but I know the committee were interested in the, the commissioner's scope for engaging external advice and expenditure. Um, the financial memorandum is quite tight, I think. For consultancy advice, there's a 5,000 pounds limit within which the Commissioner could act, and if it was a single tender exercise, I think that's the old terminology, this committee is more familiar with the new terminology perhaps than me, um, that would have to be submitted or accompanied by a business case to the Department. Um, so again, there's quite a tight control on the, the financing within the, the Commissioner's office. In terms of staffing, the staff the support to the Commissioner are civil servants from um, the Executive Office. And he has three staff at the moment. So that's a quick run through of the Commissioner here and her role. And then I'll just quickly move on to the, the position in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, in Scotland, there isn't a single Commissioner for Public Appointments. It's a role which has been um, encompassed within the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. And I know Ms. Houston, um, she left her post in 2011 as Commissioner, and she was. Uh, Concerned that there may have been some changes in the, mm -hmm. the functions of, in relation to the commissioner for, or the regulation for big appointments. So just explain a little bit about that. In terms of the areas that are covered by what is now the commissioner for um, ethical standards in public life, I think it's probably easiest to explain those in terms of investigating complaints. So the commissioner can investigate complaints against uh, members of the Scottish Parliament local councillors, members of boards, um, and more recently uh, regulates the lobbying uh, of members in the Scottish Parliament. And the last area which falls within the remit is the regulation of uh, public appointments in Scotland. And that is, there's been an amalgamation over time of those rules. In 2011, a number of rules were brought together. In 2013, they were further brought together, re really for reasons of accountability, uh, or efficiency, um, and financial value for money. So there's now one commissioner carrying out a range of functions. The functions remain as they were in the originating legislation, and that's detailed um, in the table on page five. If I just talk about uh, some of the features of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. They, they, they encompass, as I have said, the remit in relation to public appointments, but those functions date back to the original legislation, and nothing really has changed in terms of 
these features. Um, they're not new in a sense to the, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards. They apply to the old um, public uh, appointments commissioner. So in terms of appointment, the Ethical Standards Commissioner is appointed by the Parliamentary Corporation, so that would be the equivalent of our Assembly Commission. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of one of the things which isn't mentioned in terms of the Commissioner here is removal. There's a provision uh, in the Scottish legislation for removal of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards, and that requires a two-thirds majority within the Parliament to, re to remove uh, her from post. In terms of independence, there's a statutory um, provision that the Commissioner will be independent from a range of people, including the Scottish Government, and the Scottish Parliament and the corporate body itself. Uh, the financing and staffing of the uh, Commissioner is via the Sc Scottish Parliament uh, corporate body, and the Standards Commissioner is account accountable officer there. So there's a greater degree of independence in, in terms of our Commissioner and the Department of the Executive Office. Again, staff and advisors, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards has the power to appoint um, staff and to contract advisors and to seek assistance uh, within their budget. Very briefly, the functions in relation to public appointments are much the same as the Commissioner here's functions in relation to public appointments, but one of the issues which I know uh, some of the committee members raised was uh, in relation to complaints and halting of exercises that were underway. And on page eight, I've highlighted that yeah, where, where there has been a material um, serious breach of the code, the Commissioner can then take action. Um, and that action would be to inform the Minister of, the, of their view and, as I say on, on page 8, the, the Commissioner, if the position hasn't been filled, can then ask that uh, that be put on hold uh, through the, the Parliament. Um, and serious breaches of the Code must be reported through the Parliament. So that, that, that's a very brief overview of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards remit. And just to put that in some sort of context, in her annual report, um, she noted that look, going forward, and I have the quotation there, devoting limited resources to the production of thematic reviews, governance research, and recommendation for improvement is only valuable if acted upon by relevant stakeholders which generally has not been the situation of late. So I think it's one thing to look at the legislation and the, the powers that are there, but in terms of, in practice, how it's uh, working out, it would appear from our annual report that there is room for improvement, let's say. Uh, so the final section of the paper then looks at the International Ombudsman Standards. It's a membership organisation. It's there to promote good practice amongst ombuds, uh, men ombudspersons, and there are four ethical principles which have set out. Uh, the one I think which is probably of most interest to members was the independence of the office and the standards of practice which flow from the ethical standards are set out at the bottom of page 8 and the first two are again probably the two most relevant. So the Ombudsman office and the Ombudsman are independent from other organisational entities and again as I mentioned before that's a question of d degree. Arms length body certainly is some degree independent, but there are probably greater degrees of independence, and that's a policy decision, really, how far that independence should extend. And the other point is that the Ombudsman holds no other position within the organisation. Now, in terms of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, for example, that Commissioner, she is prohibited from holding a range of posts. Um, councillor as a member of the Parliament. So there are legislative provisions there. As I say, our um, order very brief. Those are gaps which aren't dealt with in the order. So maybe leave it there. And okay. any questions, Chair? Yes, sir. Sorry. Chair. Yeah, uh, first of all, I wasn't here at the start, so I declare an interest sponsor of the 
bill or to give rise to this situation. Um, so the arrangements we presently have are the only control is the prerogative control under Section 23.3 of the Northern Ireland Act. Is that correct? Yes, to amend the, the order. Yes. And that power lies exclusively outside the Assembly and exclusively with the First and Deputy First Minister. Yes, I must stress I'm not a lawyer, but yes, that's my understanding. Clause 3 of my bill would bring that within the ambit of the Assembly any changes to those orders by requiring uh, affirmative resolution of any changes to the original orders. Is that correct? Yes, and you, that's my understanding. But, yeah. but even with that, we still have an office which you couldn't really de you couldn't describe it as an arm's length body even, could you? Well it is described as an arm's length body and Well in uh, terms of its independence. Well it it's arm length in a sense that the functions are independent. Does really it have its own budget? Once agreed by the executive office. Yes, whatever the executive office gives it. Yes. Yes. Does it employ its own staff? No. It's, it is a certain executive office or other civil service staff are seconded to it. So when you apply that to the international standard on independence, it falls down on first requirement of being independent from other organisational entities, namely the Executive Office. Is that correct? Well, I think, as I mentioned, there's a degree, it's probably a spectrum of independence, and where this falls mm -hmm. is maybe a one part of it. You can certainly move to either side of where it lies. Um, as the and among, the public, among the public appointments that the Public Appointments Commissioner would be expected to oversee would be appointments by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. That's correct. And indeed, maybe that's of all the departments where m more public appointments come than anywhere else. I'm not sure of the exact numbers. And then the fifth standard, international standard, is that the Ombudsman has authority to select Ombudsman office staff mm. and manage the budget and operations. Doesn't exactly match up to that, does it? No, the staff are, as I said, seconded from the executive office. So when you apply the international standards, we have a prevailing situation which is falling fairly far short. Is that fair? I would like to comment on whether it was far short, but it's certainly a falling problem. short. A member um, uh, and any other committee members may form an opinion. That. As I said, there's no objective standard. It's yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, do we have any other further questions? Uh, just before you go, Tim, and thank you very much indeed for your detailed work and the rest of it. Um, Jim has given me a sort of a fairly detailed note here, but following the presentation that we should consider the position, our position on the bill in relation to this matter, and would we be minded to look at a new clause to the bill in relation for a commissioner for public appointments? Now, if we were, that would require uh, additional written evidence and to hold additional uh, oral evidence sessions, um, and this will add a number of weeks to the committee stage of the bill. However, uh, and speaking as the chair, and having read the international standards of practice, I am concerned that if we're not addressing this issue, that's something that may indeed in the future come back to uh, sort of haunt us on a degree. Now, I appreciate that we are asking to do additional work on this matter. However, I think looking at, and again, 
and Tim, thank you very much indeed for your work. But I think the way you've answered your questions there, and we've looked at the international standards, there are indeed questions that are raised here. So, Jim, you're the sponsor of the bill. So, what's your thoughts? Well, I think one of the issues is partially addressed by Clause 3 of my bill, in that we would subject any attempt to exercise further prerogative powers to the control of the Assembly. And that's something that's already happening with Clause 3 of the Bill. In terms of a more extensive piece of work to actually create within the framework of the Bill legislation to govern the entire office, ideally I'd like that done, but I think a, a middle path might be taking what section Clause 3 already does proves the situation. In our report, we could make a strong recommendation that legislative action is taken to put the office on a more independent footing. And then, if that was not taken forward, we as a committee could come back to it. So we'd make a recommendation to the executive office? Probably is yeah. I would think it's the executive office. Yeah, that they take legislative action on this issue. Other thoughts? Legislative action on this issue? Yes, because at the present time, the public appointments commissioner, her functions are set out in a prerogative order, as we've heard today. There's no flesh on the bones. Uh, it's, and there's no independence for the office, and that they don't even have their own budget, can't appoint their own staff. Um, so I would have thought, if we think it's beyond the scope of this committee during the consideration of my bill to do that, we should recommend that that be addressed going forward. And the executive should bring forward legislation to deal with that. If they fail to do so, then this committee might come back to it and decide to do it. Well, yeah, yeah. I think it's all about timings mm. and about what it does to the actual bill, uh, and whether it becomes a greater thing than the actual scope of the bill. Although I, I, I have no doubt it could fit in it, but it maybe increases then exponentially the size and scope of the bill. That makes it on. Wieldy for for further scrutiny and then be it within the chamber. So clear, concise legislation is always best going forward. Uh, I do think there's a need and a requirement here to address this. I, I can tell you of other instances where you have bodies out there, say for instance bodies that would represent consumers, and then when departments are criticised. Departments would be very quick to pick up the phone and ask questions around budget for next year, that very body, which is in, in effect a threat to basically say, keep quiet, you don't know what you're talking about. So these things happen out there, uh, and that's why it's important to ensure the independence and safety of the independence of bodies, uh, none least the body that we're talking about there with regards to public appointments. So I think there's a need there, a requirement. How we go about doing it and the vehicle we use is the question. Uh, by putting in a, in a report, by laying the gauntlet down, if you like, the marker down, to, is no guarantee that any department will do it. Uh, and then we may have to come back and address it anyway. If that's the case, we could run out of time, term time. Mm. So that would be us then putting into a report for the next committee and whoever sits in that committee. Mm. There's no future proofing that there. Um, so to me, the dilemma and the question is, do we hit the nail on the head now? And what does that do to our time and the bill itself? Or do we put the marker down and hope that fate's kind that requirement and that someone, either this committee or the future committee or the department, 
will run with it and actually do it justice? That's the question in my eyes. I don't know my concern is we have a fixed timeline on this bill mm -hmm. and that the extension is the 2nd of December. Yep. I'm not aware of any mechanism whereby that can be further extended. So if we embark on a piece of work which might be quite extensive, we could be in severe difficulties with that deadline. Uh, whereas I would like to move forward. We've already in clause three, if it recommends itself to the committee, taking care of part of the problem, in that we're now going to give assembly control. There's the other outstanding part of the problem, which is that it deserves of itself legislation. So that would be separate. And uh, that's why I think I'm suggesting the middle course. Okay, uh, Tim, I think there's a, uh, a proposal on the table there that we accept uh, as per clause three and we make a recommendation that the executive office look at the uh, process in accordance with the international ombudsman's standards looks at the appointment and uh, management well, looks at making legislative provision to bring the situation up to the international National standard. standards would we be content with that all those in favor say aye <laughs> Sorry, Chair, I just have to cl clarify that we, what, we, what we would be doing is writing as a committee to the Executive Office to. Sorry, just to be absolutely clear. Cause someone, no, it'll be in. Three. This, this committee will do a report on yeah, my on bill. bill, bill yeah. Yeah. And, that's and it will be part of that report. Yeah. I'm suggesting that we recommend there's a need for further work here, which the Executive Office should be doing mm -hmm. to bring this body up to international standards. Because we've received the evidence from it. Content with that? Sense. Yeah. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? Aye. Tim, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda written evidence on the function of government uh, miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, remind the, again, the item has been uh, recorded by Hansard. The following briefing period is related to the agenda item Clark's brief, page 71. Department will response, page 80. Correspondence from the Department, republication of 2019-20 Special Advisors Annual Report, page 85. Uh, Committee for the Executive Office response for the functioning, uh, page 92. Uh, Hansard, uh, on page 106. Um, standards and privileges response to the functioning of government bill, uh, tabled at page 12. I just remind paper in the clerk's paper, it was suggested to consider the list of questions provided and submit any further questions that may have for the bill's sponsor either before the meeting on the 8th of July or during the meeting or following the meeting. Uh, Jim, would you like to uh, respond? Well, I, I'm quite happy to... Oh, sorry, but... Me? Mm. Yes. I'm quite happy to receive whatever questions the committee wishes to send. Uh, keep me occupied over the summer. <laughs> I'm sure all these. <laughs> sad person, sad. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to deal with all that. All 63 of them? <laughs> <laughs> there might be some C of O's <laughs> in the answers, but yes. Uh, yeah, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. Okay, and can I ask you if you've got any further questions, can you submit them to um, the clerk or the whoever is acting in your while you're taking some well deserved leave, Jim? And can I seek your agreement to schedule oral evidence from. Uh, uh, Jim, on the 9th of September 2020, when we return? Agreed. Are we agreed? Yep. Uh, I should say to the committee that uh, I have been working on a number of amendments. Uh, amendments can only be laid, cannot be laid during recess. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what the return date is. When are we forming? Does anybody know when we're Back. formally going into recess? Oh. I think it's to the end of uh, uh, we're not going to the recess until the end of the month. After the twentieth. Some point after the twentieth. Sure, I'm not I'm not sure that uh, we're not in recess formally. But no. that the committee is sitting or that the assembly is sitting during recess? Uh, just just to, you know, as one slightly involved in this, my understanding is that there is no recess to end of July. Uh, and the, assemb the assembly obviously the assembly's been recalled, I think it's the twentieth or the twenty first. Yeah. Um and then recess will start at the very end of the month. 
But I think we've left ourselves the option of coming back, say, if coronavirus or something. Yeah. yeah. For so I think if Jim can table these amendments to the end of this month. Okay. I think it would be very useful to see those before the recess, because obviously I'm hearing the word Jim Alistair and reasonable in the same sentence for the first time in my life, and uh, therefore I know Where that have there's. You been? <laughs> So therefore, I know that there's some words of wisdom coming our way, which would overcome some of the concerns that have been expressed by individual members about the bill, not me personally. So it would be very useful to see see those, if we can. Well, the bills office had given me to understand, but I'll go back and check with them in case I misunderstood, that the end of this week was the deadline for amendments as far as this session was concerned. but. If it's the end of July, that's different. But we, if, if, if amendments have to be in before the end of uh, before the recess, mm. we definitely are meeting next week or the week after. Yes, I know. So therefore, we can't be in recess. No, that sounds logically right. So I just, 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 just seeking for there, clarity, I'll ask um, the clerk to... So an, another point here. From, from memory in previous bills that I've been involved in with the department, the department has agreed that it would bring an amendment during consideration stage and had to pray had provided the wording of those amendments to the committee, although, as far as they I can remember, laid. they hadn't been led. Yeah, well, either way, I, I can probably do that with certainly with the greater number of them. Yeah. Uh, I can do that. I'm sure that would leave it then that there was no uh, requirement for the, for the committee to wait and, and take oral evidence after that. Uh, that might, be, might have its own advantages. Because the committee might have something further things to say that might adjust the final version of any amendment. And I think, due to the think about that. To, yeah. to use the unique and unusual circumstances we're in, I think that would be appropriate. If we are, con to go. are we content? Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, chairperson's business. There's no chairperson's business at present. Correspondence. Uh, there's a letter from Andrew Moore, uh, who's the Alliance Party's uh, finance spokesman, requesting access to committee papers. I've taken advice um, with the, the clerk on this issue, and we have raised the issue with Chairperson's Liaisons, liaisons Group for consideration. Uh, once we get further agreement on the further guidance from the Chairperson's Liaisons Group, I'll inform uh, Mr Muir what the outcome of this is. Can I, uh, can I add to that in a wider view, Chair, if that's OK? Yep. I, I found this letter quite interesting because it rose, rose for me the first time, my time as an MLA, as to how we actually seek access to other committees' work and get advanced knowledge of that. So, you know I have a vast interest in energy. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see the files for the, the committee, committee for Economy. Mm -hmm. So, any MLA that would have a specific interest could do exactly the same as what mm. Andrew has done here. So, this could actually open up, open up information for other MLAs, which would be more cross-cutting. So, I'm wondering if, 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 if this is allowed, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be, because it's on the MLA and their burden of work at the end of the day, what they want to see and what they don't want to see. And if we're going to be open and transparent in a cross-cutting way, all MLAs <laughs> should be able to see all packs for every committee, if they so wish. So it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. Yep. And, and if it's because he has been allocated a spokesperson, or whether it's just enough to have an interest in order to get or be privy to information. If you're, con if you're content as a committee, I'll raise that with the, uh, the chairperson's liaison group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr. Chairman, the Chancellor's just announced that everyone's getting a £10 per head voucher for meals. 50% off. And 50% off, so I'm away, folks. Because <laughs> <laughs> Not until August. <laughs> there'll, be a, there'll be a rush on that one. I'd rather, I'm, I'm more happier with the VAT reduction. <laughs> uh, next on the item, Assembly uh, EU Affairs Manager regarding uh, Common Frameworks, page 129. I advise the Committee for the Executive Office is waiting details of the revised arrangements and expected Assembly scrutiny. I'd like you to consider, your, uh, to consider further one's correspondence being received from the TEO. Matthew? Yeah, I mean, the, the point I was going to raise, Chair, is um, uh, I mean, I've been making the point in general that the um, Assembly has had nowhere near enough information about 
um, management of Brexit, whether that's delivery of the protocol or just you know implications for us in general. Um, I um, I think it's worth us making clear as a committee that we, um, uh, given the, the common frameworks and several other aspects of this touch on the work of the committee, um, uh, one thing we could do is make our view known that we would like uh, that you know we would like more uh, information to be able to scrutinise what's happening. Uh, I think, um, speaking as a chairperson, I feel completely denuded of any, inf any information. Bearing in mind when we come back in September, we're right into the. The, the last quarter before it's due. So I would be minded to write to the executive office, because that's where the responsibility lies, to say that we would, even during the period where we're in re recess, we would like as much information forward to us as possible. I mean, just add, that, that was the point I made yesterday. It's, it's, it's less about, <laughs> you know, within this committee, people have very strong views on Brexit and indeed the protocol. Um, this is about the actual legislative work. We, uh, the, the, I think we can do it in a way which is not about our having an argument about the, the merits of, or, or otherwise of Brexit. But there's a huge amount of stuff we're going to do to scrutinise this autumn, and we don't know yet. We haven't been given an update yet on the volume. There will be a, a, a small handful, probably, of bits of primary legislation. Um, that, will that involve any work for this committee? There will be a load of statute. There have already have been some mm -hmm. legislative consent motions, statutory instruments, just from a, a workload perspective. I think we need a, an update on the legislative um, yeah. programme. I mean, I think it's just from discussions that had gone before, but immediately, uh, it was probably about a month ago, we were looking at somewhere like sort of eight pieces of primary legislation and up to 65 or 66 subsidiary pieces. That would be a substantial burden for sort of any committee structure to be able to deal with that, and I'd imagine that would take up much of our workload in the autumn. To be honest, I think are many of those likely to fall here, though? Uh, that's what we don't know we don't the know. scope of it. That's a problem. We haven't been given the. You know, we don't know what. Sorry, I hate to get all Rumsfeldish, and everybody seems to be quoting American politicians at the moment. But we don't know what we don't know yet. Yeah. Sean. No. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I that. Right. Okay. Uh, if we're content, then I would. Uh, so, Chair, that for clarity is to uh, Red EO to get an update on the legislative programme in relation to Brexit. Yes. Please. Thank you. Uh, next is response from the Department of Infrastructure regarding financial support for business adversely affected by COVID, page 131. Any commentary? So just on that, uh, two weeks ago, not last week, the week before, I just had asked to find out which department that sits on. Uh, that was left to the clerk, I think, to find out. We decided not to write the economy or not to write to infrastructure. Just who, who's, which department does that sit with? It was to be yesterday in the chamber as well. Um, I think from memory last week uh, the two responses were brought together to the committee from, from both of those and I think they are working together to come up with something as far as I remember was the really response. Knows, that's right. My apologies. It's just thank you. That's enough. Uh, uh, item from the Department of Infrastructure regarding support for business are adversely affected by COVID and page 13. Sorry, we've had that. Apologies. From the Department of Communities regarding financial support for businesses adversely affected by COVID 19 and page 135. Any comments? Are we content to note? Uh, next, uh, Belfast Chamber regarding policy paper Building uh, Belfast Back Better, page 137. And an email from uh, a Mr. Simon Hamilton, who used to be of these parishes, uh, offering to discuss the paper in more detail, in more depth, tabled at page 42. Um, this is a, it's an excellent piece of work, and Belfast Chamber of Commerce has done a very good piece of work. However, there are other chambers of commerce across sort of our, our province, here, here. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that London Dairy Chamber of Commerce has done a quite a good piece of work, and the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce has done quite useful pieces of work. I think it might be appropriate if we should look in the forward work programme of getting the Chambers of Commerce to come and talk to us directly, uh, particularly in the autumn when we've got to probably have a better ability to bring bring them in if we're content, rather than just taking one Chamber of Commerce bring bring a bring a few in. Yep. Are we content? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yep. Uh, oh, I've got a very nice letter from the um, sort of the permanent secretary on page 144, reference land web. Uh, I've already spoken uh, today about uh, uh, interest on this issue and the fact it's been uh, uh, passed to the Public Accounts Committee. 
Uh, I think uh, we're probably content in the view of that to note. Are we content to note? Noted. Great. For the Minister regarding clarification of businesses included in rates relief on page 149. Members, have we any comment? We are content to note. Well, all I can say, Mr Chairman, given what the Chancellor's announced today and what's been done, that has to be the right measure to kick start yeah. the economy, particularly in the hospitality sector. Yeah. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, then heaven help us, because uh, both are incredibly positive developments. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think our, our remarks have been recorded in that, but thank you very much indeed, Jim. Uh, if we move on to the Department response regarding businesses with multiple owned sites, page 151. Members, any comments? And I think, Paul, you raised an issue, and maybe Jim, you raised an issue about that? Multiple owned sites? I think I did, yeah. I don't remember. Are we content to note? I think I asked you. This is the. I asked him this as well. The. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pivotal have produced a new report, a new economic vision, on page 152. Uh, a copy of the report has been included for members in the routine papers. Uh, members, do we have any comments? No, other than they correctly ident correctly diagnose several long-standing problems that we've discussed here and have discussed elsewhere. <laughs> Are we content to note? No. I was going to say something about blinding and obvious, but I won't. Right. Uh, from the Committee for Justice regarding Westminster Acts containing provisions and devolved matters yet to be commenced. This is on page 153. Uh, members, the Committee for Justice has considered two Acts of Parliament passed during the absence of the Assembly and received confirmation from the Executive Office in relation to a third Act, which falls within the remit of the Department of Finance. The Committee for Justice agreed to inform the Committee that the Digital Economy Act 2017, which was passed during the absence of the Assembly, also contains de devolved provisions from which remain to be commenced. Uh, in normal circumstances, the Assembly would have been asked to agree a legislative consent motion following consideration and a report by the Committee of, for Finance. I would like to seek your agreement to copy the correspondence from the Committee for Justice to the Department of Finance, asking the Department to outline the details of the Digital Economy Act 2017 and the devolved provisions contained therein, when it plans to commence the devolved provisions contained in the Act, and how it plans to engage with the Committee and gain the consent of the Assembly to the devolved provisions in the Act. Are we content to do that? Content. Okay. content. Uh, from London Derry Chamber uh, regarding PPE procurement in Northern Ireland position paper, uh, Mick, I will. <coughs> May I pass an apology to the Chief Executive of London Derry Chamber because I've been trying to get in contact with him and where our Zoom calls have been missed over the last week, but I intend to talk to him this week. And, but I think uh, it's an interesting paper and I would like your agreement to forward this to RAISE to inform its research and res uh, respond to London Derry Chamber to inform them that the research was commissioned and its paper forward. Are we content? Yep. Chair, if I could speak to that, that that's the issue. Uh, I had a, had a meeting with uh, some of these guys, uh, and that's where I brought last week the issue around the buy and make strategy from the Scottish mm -hmm. NHS system. Uh, it's also come to light that uh, Midney Stanton and Borough Council have actually uh, containment issue, uh, procurement issue uh, mechanism also in in play. So all of that could be explored, uh, because I do think there is a real gain here if we can get our act together. And I don't know why we're not talking about this more. Not not us, of course, but you know PLC, Northern Ireland PLC. Why we aren't acting this out in the same way as NHS Scotland has, uh, especially when our supply lines from China seem to be very fragile at times. So, yeah, this is something that we should be exploring. Melissa. And, uh, just on the same point as well, too, and it's one that concerns me. And uh, I noticed that some of the people who had been supplying PPEs and the likes of it, where they had diversified within yeah. uh, their own work, and as they return now to address that market, um, I actually think that there's an argument there for government to support them and continue to provide PPEs at the same time. Uh, whilst uh, I can accept sort of uh, the whole argument c uh, competitivity and the likes of it, you know, and uh, pricing as a result of that, uh, but at the same time to secure our own supply, I would think is a very, very high priority there. And I do know too that already with some of those uh, manufacturers, 
that um, because of maybe um, uh, the production and the market that they addressed previously, they're actually talking there about redundancies in the likes of it. So therefore, uh, I, I do think it's important maybe that whole issue is addressed that we start yeah. taking it on board. Yeah. Um, and I mean, just to, just to put on record, the likes of the companies like O'Neill's that were managed to sort of repurpose themselves in a, a very short period of time to be able to do that. Yeah. But again, one of the questions I think we might consider, but this needs to be considered at a wider business within the assembly, is how we build up resilience and building up a, an effective PPE manufacturing business within Northern Ireland. And I have been led to believe that some companies are actually producing uh, goods at costs that match or are fairly similar to those that are being imported. So there should be an opportunity here to look at that. But particularly sort of for smaller businesses, wherever they be, we need to yeah. be able to look at that. May I take then, as an action from the committee, maybe it's worth writing to the Department of the Economy and to the, or sort of the Committee for the Economy and Committee for Health as well. Yep. just to raise the issue of uh, manufacture of PPE within Northern Ireland and looking for opportunities, particularly for the likes of Invest, to make sure that we retain a base for this now that we've developed it. Yeah. Would we be content to do that? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, next up is a uh, departmental response for the Committee for the Economy regarding financial support for businesses on page 170. Have we any comments? Content to note? Uh, Department from the Economy response regarding multiple owned sites uh, tabled at page 43. Members, do we have any comments or are we content to note? Content to note. Uh, next one is uh, tabled uh, page 44, Departmental response to North-South imp implementation bodies. And I think, Jim, this was in response to the question yes. you asked. Um, I don't know, but as a chair and speaking to somebody who's had a previous um, uh, senior, several senior roles. Um, what I can't understand is if they're reporting that what was done was irregular, mm. how does that leave the accounts? And how can it both be irregular and legal? I'm not, I can't, don't understand that. Could I make two points? Yeah. Uh, first point is I'm disappointed uh, that when the Permanent Secretary was here, and asked about this, that she did not tell us that this was irregular spend. Secondly, if it was irregular spend, then it is a matter for the controller and auditor general, and the accounts would need to show that. And I would like to know, do all the departments who have north-south bodies with irregular spends have their, has that been noted on their accounts? Uh, or if this question hadn't been asked, would no one have ever known that? Is it, is it on the annual accounts of each of those departments that this was irregular spend? Whether it's illegal <laughs> or... Um, I think the point about being illegal was it's irregular because the North-South Council and the finance ministers were never able to authorise the money to go to the bodies. But the money that got to the bodies then was capable of being spent on the authorisation of the department rather than the minister, which is why they say it wasn't illegal. But my problem is a bit like your own, Mr Chairman, I think. If the route by which it went to the bodies wasn't legal. How does it coming out the other end be legal? Um, and speaking of, uh, as as the chairman and I think us, the committee we should we must write and ask how the accounts can both be sort of irregular and legal. And have the, there's a particular word for it? Have the accounts been um, qualified? Qualified. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I just, when I read language like that, and people might think this is a semantic issue, but if at some stage in the future there has been misappropriation or there has been some other form of irregularity apart from the creation of how the sort of the mm. the the, the, uh, <coughs> the appointment and expenditure was set up, and it shows there's a degree of irregularity. 
And if it comes back to here, and we are being asked to investigate it, we can't, on all sort of legitimacy, stand over something that's been said to be both irregular and legal unless it's been explained to us. I don't understand I how think, we could do I it. I think the only body of the six that falls under finance is probably the SEUPB. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would were the finance that. accounts yep. qualified? Uh, I suppose we could ask each of the other departments who have north south bodies were their accounts qualified? But to be fair, Chair, my, if I may, I, um, I, I don't doubt that there's a, um, uh, uh, an issue here that um, people have a right to raise. My question would be why, given that um, uh, we know that for three years there was a huge amount of activity that had to be spending that had to be approved um, uh, across the public sector uh, in Northern Ireland and not just in North South bodies, we would focus exclusively on North South implementation bodies. Um, I, so I, um, why, are, why are we simply? asking the question about north-south bodies. Is there something we deem to be particularly suspicious or um, noteworthy about them? Or are we asking the question uh, across a range? We could, we could ask every single accounting officer how every single bit of spending was approved in the three years that there, was, there were no ministers to approve spending. So I would be wary about looking like we are um, pursuing a, a particular agenda against north-south implementation bodies. No, I don't, I don't. My intention, and I think the intention is not. It was just the north and south bodies was the ones that was highlighted. No, I think it's a genuine question to ask across all all the bodies during that period of time. Chair, uh, I take uh, point, uh, but the, to me the issue is well, you have to eat an elephant in small chunks, and and it has raised. This has been raised by a question, a very valid question in this committee. Uh, we have got the answer. We don't like the answer. We think there's more investigation needs done. That's what we're here for as a scrutiny committee. So I have no problems asking these questions. And if we find through the questioning and if we find through our investigations and presentations that there are other spends that are ir irregular, then I think we need to pursue that too. Uh, I suppose I'm going to use a, a very American line here. Uh, as a finance committee, we need to chase the money. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm all for scrutiny, uh, because you see, at the heart of this, and I go back to Jim's point about disappointment about the Permanent Secretary either not telling us or not knowing it in this committee. And so uh, there's a transparency issue, but then there's also an accountability issue if these are all regular spends. Okay. Um, Is it, could I just say one thing to Matthew? I think. There are particular statutory provisions governing north-south bodies which require various steps for their funding. And that's what, something I've pursued with this MBFL and, and since uh, as to whether all those requirements were being met. Uh, I don't, well, I stand to be corrected, I don't think there are many other bodies with the same statutory provisions about their funding arrangements because and the reason for that is they're jointly funded in the main from north and south. Um, and yeah, there wouldn't be too many bodies in that. Um, team, I'm just I'm very conscious of the sort of uh, tightness of time here, and the PAC are in here at three o'clock, and we've got some more business to deal with. But uh, I would uh, I, I would like to write I will write as the chair to just ask for an explanation of how uh, the accounts can both be irregular and legal, and just ask for a def definition of that. That would, I think, go quite a long way to assuage uh, people's thoughts. Are we content? Great. Uh, move on. Uh, Committee for Communities regarding Solus Northern Ireland update is tabled at page 47. Any comments? Are we content to note? note. Uh, from Nilga regarding financial sustainability of councils in Northern Ireland, tabled at page 58. Any comments? Content to note? Uh, correspondence from the Committee for Communities regarding local councils' rates guarantee tables at page 59. Members, do we have any comments? Kent to note. It's, uh, sorry, to, sorry, to go back a step on the Nilga. Um, on the Nilga question, the um, we we're content to note, but they're requesting a 
meeting with yourself. Mm -hmm. You all set that up. Is it, which I'm perfectly supportive of that, um, uh, with your party colleague, I know Mr. Mr. Kim, not, not, and the, I don't mean that in a suspicious way, I just, but is there, is it, should we be, um, and maybe this is what you're about to come on to, be, well, in fact you are, because Kevin Peelan's letter talks about it, but I'm just a, bit, a bro broader evidence on, on the financial position of local councils. Yeah, and I think we should probably be looking for the broader evidence on position of councils after we've digested the latest chunk of that's come through yeah. from the Chancellor, and we're looking at what will then be, uh, I think we were getting fairly close to the budget number three bill and the impact it has on local government. And we should be then be able to see some of the uh, outworkings, particularly reference uh, rates and what has happened, um, particularly if councils manage to get some of their premises reopened and restore restoration of services. Yeah, revenue, Jeff. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Tim, if we any other business? Just so, on, sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Uh, we went, Paul. Uh, on correspondence in our main packs. I see, as I go, do every week, I go back to the request for departmental information, and there, lo and behold, uh, there was questions raised by this committee uh, to the head of the civil service around disciplinary processes arising from the RHI inquiry. We asked uh, for numbers and for grade profiles of staff. We asked for a number of those investigations that will be progressing to formal disciplinary action been taken, the number of staff who have resigned or retired, a copy of the report once the process had been completed. Uh, we, uh, so we have asked for all of that, and none of that has been forthcoming. None of that. Now again, that's not from a minister. That's not been, you know, this is coming from the head of the civil service, and we have a doubt where the Finance Committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly is not good enough. And I want to know why they have missed the deadline by nearly a month. Are we content to, again, contact the, through the DLO and also directly to the um, Permanent Secretary about why we have missed the deadlines? I think that is unacceptable. Are we content? Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Uh, we're now moved, just before we move on to uh, correspondence regarding the joint order for PPE, uh, the date and time of the next meeting, because we will go into closed session uh, fairly soon into this. Uh, next Wednesday, the 9th of September at 12.30 in the Senate Chamber is what the schedule is. Okay. Sorry, when's the next meeting? Uh, 9th of September. I will remain at half 12. Half 12, yeah. All right. Is that half 12 going to be our next time now? Uh, until the next consideration of return to yeah, normal business, businesses. Normal businesses. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, moving on then to correspondence regarding the joint order for personal protection equipment. We are dealing now specifically with the non-sensitive items and the areas that are not covered for it. Uh, the following papers relate to this agenda item, which is the clerk's brief on page 184. And the letter from the minister and associated non-sensitive emails on page 187. Uh, you've been hand-delivered hard copies of the confidential papers, but we'll not discuss that until we go into closed session. Now, specifically, and bearing in mind very carefully about the sensitivities of the issues, uh, have we any comments on the um, specifically on the non-sensitive uh, emails? Uh, if I could raise the first point, uh, I think I have to raise as a duty. So, in the batch, and I'm not going to mention anything, in the batch of confidential emails, we have contained in them emails in that batch that we have already received. Yes. So, it's a bit of a. Well, so how do we proceed? Do we, if we go back to the 22nd of April when I think we received the first batch? And talk about these e those emails and the content within, and then the department comes back to say, no, no, they are actually the confidential ones you were talking about. Where does that leave this committee? That's the first thing, because we've already had them. Uh, that's the first nonsense out of the way. Uh, on on, I, I still can't for the life of me having a wide spectrum of all the emails we received. The first, the initial batch, the non-sensitive batch, and then the the confidential batch. All, all these emails now pigeonholed in these different things. 
I do not see for the life of me how some of them are sensitive, commercially sensitive, and others are not. How some are confidential and others are not. They are all very much of a muchness, and it's just basically communication between two civil servants or more. Uh, so I want to know where the thinking, the logic, the apparatus was put in place that actually decreed in, in, in the head of a civil service servant what emails we got in that first batch. The 22nd of April, I think, was the first uh, committee we saw sight of any email. Where was the logical siphoning of the email trail? And how did we only get part of what we should have got at that point? And then, of course, the secrecy comes in. Why did they not tell us at that point? Well, you know something? We do have other emails, and they're all you know, sensitive, or they're all commercially sensitive, or all confidential. And it gave us an explanatory note at that regard, at that point. Where was the weakness and the failure there, and how did that occur? Because now what that's left in my head is, do I believe any department when I ask for all and every piece of information? Do I, do I believe them? No, I don't. Do I believe that we have received all of our emails now? Actually, I don't. Um, so that's, that's the second point. On the detail, on the detail of the non-sensitive batch of emails, to me this is important. It's very clear that civil service from the Department of Finance copied and pasted the press release from the finance minister in a very open and transparent way to her opposite number down south. And that's quite legit in my eyes because it's just being completely open. But within half an hour, within half an hour of that email and that press release going, we have a very alarming email back. And I read, because I think it's right that we get this into some sort of record. And I'll not name names. Thanks for advising. This is of the press statement. The announcement is unhelpful in that it does not reflect where we are at. The North-South collaboration is the right thing to do, and we hope to be in a position to work through a joint order, but we're not there yet. We have yet to identify a supplier who can take an order. We are briefing our minister and the Department of the Taoiseach on this as we speak, but it would be really helpful if this could be corrected immediately so that it does not create embarrassment <laughs> for either government. Many thanks, regards, and then the civil servant from down south is named. What was the date time group of that email, Mr? That, that, was a, that, that email, which, which I have recited, was sent on the 27th of March 2020 at 5.59. And the civil servant who had sent the original press statement came back within a minute. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, two minutes. Completely understand. I speak to our press office. End. Now, where is the procedure with regards to communication with the press office, where there's a red light shining here from a different jurisdiction to say, look, we may have done something terribly wrong. This might have caused a real problem for the government down south. How do we rectify this? Now, how you reflect, rectify a press statement going out is you basically produce another press statement. But what we know through hindsight is when the media raised this issue, when the, when, when the, I think it was Nolan Show that first broke it, when Nolan Show raised this issue, there was silence. There was silence from the department. So instead of rectifying the situation, which the, government, the Irish Republican government down south asked them to do, they sat on it. They sat on it. Which then raised all of the issues that we have been trying to entangle for the last, what, two, three, four months. And we have had to spend time on it, when it could have been clarified very easily by a second press statement. And the minister could come up and say, look, we've got this wrong, we've jumped the gun, there's not even an order in place. 
and I'm sorry for misleading leading the House. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, uh, one has to be careful in this session not to talk about the confidential emails, but I want to make a couple of points. I would, we, would we feel happier to move into confidential session? Oh, I'd like to make this point first. If okay. In the emails that we have been released, released to us, I think I could say this both of the confidential and the non-confidential, there is no sign of anything that would have justified the Minister on the 27th of March saying an order had been placed. Then there's the email later that day, after he'd said it, from the Republic to the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which Paul Frew has referred to. And yet, despite that email making it abundantly clear there was no order at that point, the Minister came to the House on the 31st of March, four days later, and in answer to Mr O'Toole, talked about the joint order with the government in Dublin. He must have known, his department knew, that there was no joint order. And yet, instead of taking that opportunity to roll back from his Friday statement about a joint order, he compounded it by talking about the joint order with the Dublin government. And it's in that that I still believe he misled the House. There's other material in the confidential. Well, get that to that. Will that. Lisa? Uh, just to the Chair, uh, <clears throat> I'm not that sure how often I have to say uh, that I'm weary with all of this. Um, just a few minutes ago, another speaker was actually saying uh, about the limitation in terms of time uh, in relation to his bill that has been brought forward, uh, and that that time uh, is so limited as a result of the amount of time that we are expending needlessly, continuing to harrow ground that has been ploughed a thousand and one times. Uh, that when one now focuses in on emails that were there for the public from the outset and that were then presented to us again, and attempts to uh, poke out of that uh, some other reason mm -hmm. why it is that we should continue this whole issue about emails in relation to an order that never materialised, that never materialised, or in relation to funds that never were spent, that never were spent. But of anything, uh, all of these emails do reflect one thing in particular. It hasn't been acknowledged at all by other people on this committee that every effort was being made to secure PPEs at that time, and yet now, because of um, other people entering the market and the likes of it, they found that that order could not be delivered on, and that was acknowledged, acknowledged at the time as well too. And I am actually suggesting now that. In relation to this item on the agenda, i.e., the emails that are there public, and I would actually incorporate those then too when we get to the stage of it being confidential, that I would be expressing the same opinion and suggesting it's time this committee moved on. We put this to bed, it is there, we see it, we know exactly what happened, we all know um, the efforts that were being made not just by the Minister of Finance, but in conjunction with other ministers as well, too, in order to achieve the best result for all of our people. And I'm recommending, and I'm, I'm putting it as a proposal, it's time we marked our card in this, and it's time we moved on. Okay. Ah. Thanks very much, um, uh, Chair. Uh, I want to put it on record that uh, for the civil service, for all of the effort that they made in order to try to secure PPE. I don't think anyone here doubts that at all. Um, I, I note from page 53, there are 100 pages of emails that have gone back and forth. So we have to remember the time that was in it and the, the, the scarcity of PPE and the, the, 
Luckily, we didn't hit those heights of fatalities which was forecast at the start of it. Um, I think that I just want to make the point, and I want to be measured in the point as well. I know we have to move on, but the correspondence uh, was a general point about how the civil service operated within uh, those difficult times. I know we're going to be discussing in private session later, but I want to put it on record that and we did by a letter from the committee sent it to the department in order to thank them. So we did thank them and we were aware of what they were doing there as well at the time. Okay. Um, but, but I will say there's different types of technologies. We've all heard to look with virtual ordering and stuff and how to communicate officially this really didn't seem from, from my point of view, a very efficient way in order for the civil service in order to be communicating like 100 pages or, or for me, which I could think, have been a simple uh, order. Tim, just looking at sort of time and the rest of it, I would like us now to move into closed close session, and we will do that as well, if we could move into closed session. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, 2019-2020.